show your support. Like, share and subscribe. Hello, I am that British guy and welcome to a completely brand new series for my channel. Now, in one of my videos earlier this year, I said that I was dropping the pay-per-view predictions videos. Basically, a lot of people are doing that kind of thing, and I want to do something a little bit different. I will still be doing predictions on my Facebook page and my Twitter account. What I thought I would do instead is something around uh, historic pay-per-views relevant to the month that we're in. So obviously this starting in January with the Royal Rumble, we're looking back at historic Royal Rumbles. However, again, what I don't want to do is the same thing that everybody else is doing and look at an old Royal Rumble um, pay-per-view and review it and give my thoughts on it because, again, a lot of people are doing that same sort of thing. So what I thought I would do is look at the Raw episode the night after the pay-per-view. Just to see what the fallout from the events at the pay-per-view actually were. How they impact the storytelling going forward. Because as I said at the very beginning of launching this channel, I am very much interested in the wrestling side of things. More for the storytelling aspect and the characters. That is sort of more my focus. So for this video, we are going to be looking at the Raw after the 1999 Royal Rumble. Now just a recap for those of you that are a bit hazy with your history. The 1999 Royal Rumble was the No Chance in Hell Royal Rumble. Now this was the one where Stone Cold Steve Austin and Vince McMahon both entered at one and two. And after a brief sort of scuffle in the ring, they both exited and the corporation actually took Austin out of the duration of the match. He then returned right near the end very similar to what happened to Roman Reigns, only he got cheered instead of booed. And it went down to those two as the last two competitors in the Rumble. And thanks to a distraction by The Rock, Vince McMahon was able to eliminate Stone Cold Steve Austin, preventing him from going to WrestleMania 15 and competing for the WWF title. And in that same Royal Rumble... That was the infamous I Quit match between Mankind and The Rock for the WWF title. So by the end of the night, you had the corporation winning the title and winning the Rumble. So they were massively on top. So let's see what happens the night after on Raw. Now, as you can imagine, Raw opens up with a massive celebration for the corporation. Everyone comes down. Led, obviously, by Vince McMahon. The Rock is there with his WWF title. Ken Shamrock and the Big Boss Man are there, the tag team champions. Ken Shamrock is also the Intercontinental Champion. You've got Shane McMahon and Tess there, and obviously the Stooges of Pat Patterson and Gerald Briscoe as well. So there's a lot of gold in the ring. You've got the Royal Rumble Champion as well, and the whole thing is just going on about how Vince McMahon promised that Austin had no chance in hell to win the Royal Rumble and how he basically managed to live up to his promise, prevented Austin from going to WrestleMania and you got a little bit of celebration there as well with The Rock beating Mankind for the WWF title so everything is solely focused on the corporation and it's in this opening segment that Vince McMahon basically looks Rock right in the eye and says to him, don't worry Rock, even though you're the champion and I am the Royal Rumble winner, I promise you will not have to face me at WrestleMania 15. I have filed papers to the board of directors basically removing me from my title match at WrestleMania 15. And what I will do instead is hand-pick an opponent for you 
for WrestleMania 15. Heavily implying that he was either going to get a member of the corporation to go in and face The Rock and basically lay down for him, or he was going to pick a complete chump who The Rock would be able to beat in about a minute so that The Rock could have his moment at WrestleMania 15 and there wouldn't be any dissension within the corporation, anything like that. And it's at this time as well in history when we have Shawn Michaels come back for a brief stint as the WWF Commissioner. He and Austin appear up on the Titantron and Shawn Michaels basically says, yeah, you did check yourself out of the title match at WrestleMania 15 and because of that, Due to the contract of the Royal Rumble match, if the winner is unable or unwilling to compete for the WWF title at WrestleMania, the runner-up automatically takes their place. So obviously, unbeknownst to Vince McMahon, him leaving the title match means that Austin gets his shot at the WWF title at WrestleMania. And this is where Austin promises to Vince McMahon that he will put his title shot up on the line as long as he gets a match one-on-one -on -one with Vince McMahon. And that match will take place at St. Valentine's Day Massacre in your house in a couple of weeks time. That ends up becoming the main event for that night and it is a steel cage match. And Austin basically says, look, McMahon, you don't have to beat me in a wrestling match because we know you can't do that. But because you're so good at running away from a fight, why don't we go in a steel cage match? All you've got to do is knock me out for a little bit and run away and you will take my spot away from me at WrestleMania 15. You get to protect your corporate champion, The Rock, so he doesn't have to face me. What do you say? All I want is one fight with you. And McMahon agrees to this match, obviously with a plan in his head, to screw Austin from his title shot at WrestleMania 15. And you might remember that is the night where Paul White, the big show, makes his debut in the World Wrestling Federation. He comes out of the ring and manages to throw Austin basically through the cage wall. And because of that, Austin drops down to the floor and wins the match kind of backfires on Vince McMahon, but that's obviously the thought process going through his head at the moment. I can just get somebody else in that match to lay Austin out, and then I can win that match and face The Rock myself and even lay down for him. Also, a little earlier in this segment, Vince McMahon, because he promised the person who eliminated Stone Cold Steve Austin from the Rumble, he promised them $100,000 in cash, because The Rock came down and caused a distraction, it's actually The Rock that is going to get that money. So an armoured truck turns up with $100,000 in it, and later in the night, that's going to get presented to The Rock. So, after this first section, we get our first match. Gold Dust versus Billy Gunn. Now, there's a couple of other storylines going on within this match. Gold Dust actually comes down to the ring with Al Snow's head doll, and it's all painted up with all of the Gold Dust face paint on it, and that is sitting at ringside, basically. It's just underneath one of the turnbuckles. And when Billy Gunn comes down to the ring, he comes down with Triple H and China, because obviously they're all part of DX. And before the match starts, Triple H cuts a promo and basically calls The Rock out and says, look, I doubt you caused mankind to say I quit last night. And I damn sure know that there's no way you can make me say I quit. How about you and me tonight for the WWF title in an I quit match? They then leave, and as they're leaving, Goldust gets a jump up on Billy Gunn and our match begins. And it's a very short match. It's very confusing match as well, because right at the beginning, Gold Dust sets up Billy Gunn for the Shattered Dreams, which obviously is a low blow and a legal move. So you would think that the referee would just disqualify him for that. But instead of allowing the move to happen, he basically cuts Gold Dust off. 
thus allowing Billy Gunn to get back into the match, which seemed kind of confusing. Usually a referee would just let an illegal action happen and then ring the bell, but for some reason uh, the referee decides to intervene in this instance, presumably to keep the match going on, otherwise it's going to finish before it's even begun. So there's a bit of trading back and forth and gold dust spills to the outside. And at this moment, his music and Titantron hit again, and out comes the Blue Meanie from the Job Squad, which was a short-lived stable that obviously Al Snow was in as well. And he is decked out as Blue Dust. He is basically an exact replica of Gold Dust, but in blue and black instead of gold and black. And he uses this opportunity to make his way down to the ring and take back the head doll for Al Snow. However, before he manages to do this, Goldust tries to get a quick roll up on Billy Gunn from the distraction cause, but kicks out of it. And as soon as the kick out happens, he realises what Blue Dust is going to do, tries to grab head back and gets smacked over his own head with head. And Billy Gunn uses this opportunity to hit a pile driver, which was a bit weird seeing that being done again. And off of that, one, two, three, Billy Gunn wins. So it was a very short match. It kind of felt like it was only really there to further the whole job squad getting head back and an excuse for Triple H and China to come out of the ring so that Triple H could cut his promo against The Rock for later in the night. Because realistically, anyone could have faced Goldust in that match. But obviously, because it needed to be a member of DX coming out, basically so that Triple H and China could come out as well. So yeah, as I said, very short match. Very inconsequential, really. Quite typical of the Attitude Era. Very rushed, um, with kind of a schmozzy type end caused completely by a distraction and a foreign object. Next up in the ring, we have the Oddities, which was, well, odd, shall we say, just a random mishmash of people that basically everyone's forgotten about. George the Animal Steel was about the only recognisable person where you look at them and go, oh yeah, that's definitely him, without having to actually Google any of the other people. And they're in the ring ready for their match, and they're basically expelled immediately by The Rock. One guy comes down, yes he's the WWF champion, but there's four of the guys. He walks out and basically says, you, you, you and you, get out, I'm the champ, I will take all of you on. And if that doesn't make a group look weak, I don't know what does. So they all scarper, because he's the rock, even though there's four of them. And basically, he answers Triple H's challenge, and he accepts that title match for later in the night, he says... Sure, me and you, Triple H, I quit match for my title. And at that time, we see backstage footage of Mankind basically beating up one of the security guards and stealing the bag of money that has The Rock's $100,000 that he was about to be presented with in this segment. And Mankind comes out and starts dishing the money out to the front row of the audience. Now, I could see what they were trying to do with this, but it massively distracts from what's going on because the front few rows of the crowd all basically heard their way to the front in order to grab any of the notes that are falling on the floor. Because he's trying to throw them out, but obviously it's paper money, so it's falling about three inches away from his feet, and they're all scrabbling to try and get the money. And no one then is paying any attention to what Mankind's saying. Nobody cares what he's saying. It's all about quick grab the money. And it gets quite distracting quite quickly. And you could tell that Foley looked quite awkward about it. Because it didn't quite work out as he probably thought it would in his head. Because the money didn't actually go out into the audience. Anyway, he comes out and he says, Look Rock, listen to the footage of the interview that I had on heat and compare that to what I said or what I said at the Royal Rumble and he basically confirms what even an idiot could work out that it was exactly the same footage or exactly the same sound clip played at one and the other they basically used his I quit I quit I quit 
voice clip from the interview and played that in the arena at the Royal Rumble. Now he says, look Rock, be a man, face me one more time for that title at halftime heat on Sunday in an empty arena match. And The Rock agrees to this and he will face Mankind for the WWF title at halftime heat in an empty arena match. So, within the first half of this show, we have set up a main event for halftime heat for the WWF title. We've set up uh, a main event for later that night for the WWF title. We've set up a main event for some Valentine's Day Massacre for the opportunity to face the WWF champion at WrestleMania. And obviously by the end of all of three of those things, that will have set up and finalised the main event for WrestleMania 15. So we have got a hell of a lot crammed in to that first, not even an hour I don't think, regarding both sides of the WWF title. Who is going to be the champion going into WrestleMania and who is going to be the challenger going into WrestleMania and have promoted Halftime Heat and St. Valentine's Day Massacre and potentially WrestleMania 15 all in about an hour with a few overlapping bits of story. So it's really, really integrated, well-told storytelling from all aspects there. Obviously, you've then got the Triple H angle as well playing into later in the night. How's that going to affect things? Would it then be a triple threat match for halftime heat potentially? And really the rest of the show is basically filler just to get us to the main event. Because after this the oddities come back out and we have a very very short match between George the Animal Steel and Droz. Basically George the Animal Steel bites Droz's arm after that, he sort of recoils and the referee sort of sees if he's okay. The animal then bites the turnbuckle cover off of the turnbuckle for no reason at all. And Droz uses this opportunity to smash his head into it and pin him. And that's it. Then after that, we get a post-match attack. Droz just keeps beating down on him. And the oddities come out and basically make the save and take George the Animal Steel away. Then after that we get a tag team match for the tag team titles. Now obviously we've already seen and I've already said the champions at this time were Ken Shamrock who is also the Intercontinental Champion and his teammate the Big Boss Man and they are going up against Jeff Jarrett and Owen Hart and they are managed at the time by Deborah. And there's a bit of a video package basically telling us how we got to this point and over the last three weeks, Jeff Jarrett and Owen Hart have used Deborah's allure, shall we say, to basically cost the opponents the match and get surprise victories against them. So before we even start, we see that the challengers for the titles can only win their matches because their manager distracts their opponents, basically. She wears a low enough cut top so here we are, Attitude Era at its height. She wears a low cut enough top in order for them to distract their opponents and get the win. So we already know that they're not really winning on merit. And they managed to beat the champions in a non-title match. They managed to beat the New Age Outlaws. And they managed to beat Gangrel and Edge in three matches over three weeks in exactly the same way in order to get this title match. And basically, the champions dominate the majority of this match. Before the match starts, there's a little backstage skit where Bossman and Ken Shamrock are given saltpeter. And the king later explains that this was used for soldiers in the military to basically nullify their libido. Basically, the idea of this is to nullify... Deborah's influence in the match. So because of this, the champions are able to nearly, not not entirely squash, but they get about three quarters of the offense throughout the entire match until the Blue Blazer comes out, or someone certainly dressed as the Blue Blazer, because obviously at this time we knew that that was Owen Hart, and he actually makes reference to this after the match. This proves it wasn't me. 
and the blue blazer comes out and decks Ken Shamrock from behind, allowing Owen Hart to pin him and pick up the win, and they win the titles. So, not only are they not good enough to win because they need Deborah, when that doesn't work, they need outside interference in order to win this match. Great way of building a couple of guys up. You can really tell that by this point, Owen Hart and Jeff Jarrett have absolutely no friends with the management of WWF. And the only way they can basically be seen to be half decent is by using these kind of tactics. Because I can't think of a weaker way of winning the belts than needing two different types of distraction and an attack in order to pick up a win against two people that were being pushed to the moon at this point because obviously they were part of the corporation. Next up we have another corporation in-ring segment and we have Shane McMahon, Pat Patterson and Gerald Briscoe come down to the ring and call out Kane. And Shane uses this opportunity to completely annihilate Kane, verbally at least and puts him down and puts him down and puts him down and berates him and says it's all Kane's fault for what has been happening. Now this is part of a separate sort of more undercard story with other members of DX with Shane and X-Pac predominantly over the European title. It kind of ties into um, that aspect and Kane was basically meant to be an extra corporation henchman to destroy DX throughout the Rumble night and although Kane has already apologized to Shane McMahon he wants him to come back out here and apologize in front of everyone and get on his knees and basically beg for forgiveness. Now X-Pac during this comes out and tries to reason with Kane and says look you need to stop being pushed around by these people why not come back with us join DX we will look after you. We are like a family. We care about everyone within the group. If you join me now, you haven't got to put up with this anymore. We won't do this to you. And it looks like Kane is about to go with X-Pac and join DX. And then right at the last second he turns on him and delivers a choke slam. Shane then gets Kane to drag X-Pac into the corner and Shane gives him a Bronco Buster. And it's basically another McMahon segment of putting down their opponents, pretty much. Not a lot's changed, it seems. Kane looks a bit like a stooge. X-Puck looks like an idiot for trying to trust Kane. And it all just basically elevates Shane McMahon. Hmm. Where have we seen that before? Or rather, where have we seen that since? Now, the Road Dog and Billy Gunn do come out and attack the stooges. And it basically just turns into a big old brawl. But obviously within that brawl, Shane remains nice and safe and protected in his little glass cabinet over here. Next up, we have a match between Val Venus and Test. And Test is another member of the corporation. As you can tell, it's a very heavy corporation type show tonight. And they show a little bit of build up to this match of... Val Venus getting a little bit too close to Ken Shamrock's sister. And obviously Shamrock and Test have that collaboration within the corporation. It's a fairly short match again, not a lot to it. Val Venus gets the upper hand for a little bit and then Test gets it back and then goes back to Val Venus again and looks like he might get the victory. Ken Shamrock comes out and attacks him from behind with a chair and allows Test to pin him with the pump handle slam. Pretty academic to be honest. Not really a lot else to it. And just for good measure, we get another post-match beatdown between random people. Billy Gunn comes out because at the time he was also feuding with Ken Shamrock for the Intercontinental title. He just lost a title match the night before at the Royal Rumble. So he wanted to get him some of Ken Shamrock. And within that, Val Venus thinks that he got hit by Billy Gunn. So they have a bit of a back and forth brawl as well. And it all just kind of breaks down into chaos, really. So we've had four matches. 
two post-match attacks and other random attacks as well. How can you tell we're watching an Attitude Era show here? Short matches and fights everywhere. Talking of fights everywhere, the next match is a hardcore tag team match. And we have the Road Dog, who is the hardcore champion, teaming up with Al Snow. And they are going up against Gangrel and Edge. And Road Dog and Al Snow get a couple of fire extinguishers during their entrance. And manage to blindside Edge and Gangrel when they come out. Because they've got the whole fire pit thing and they come out of the floor and it's all moody, we're all vampires. So they attack them on the ramp and they go out the back. They don't even fight. They don't get anywhere near the ring, apart from obviously at the end to celebrate. But no one gets anywhere near the ring for this match. It's straight out the back and it's grab a weapon and hit someone around the head with it for 10 minutes. Oh, here's a thing. Whack. Here's another thing. Whack. And some of those headshots were brutal. It was quite shocking seeing how hard some of those hits were. All completely unprotected with like baking trays and like hollow metal pole things and like stop signs and trash cans and chairs again and again and again on each other. No one was letting up. No one was protecting their head at all at any point. And yeah, it was just 10 minutes of whack another guy around the head with a heavy thing. Um, so they kind of fight and fight and move and move. And there's a right near the end, they climb up on some crates. And at the top of the crates, there's also a balcony. And at that point, blue dust reappears and hands Al Snow the head doll that he stole from Gold Dust earlier in the night. And Al Snow uses that to basically whack it round the head of Edge and Gangrel. They all fall through a set of tables with Road Dog and Al Snow happening to basically lay across Gangrel and Edge. So they're both pinned and one, two, three, they are your winners. It was very messy, very gnarly some of the headshots and then Road Dog and Al Snow basically have to run back to the ring so that they can celebrate with the crowd. There's then a quick bit between them two afterwards where the Road Dog accepts Al Snow's challenge for the hardcore title at some point in the future. And at the end of this interview the Ministry attacks both the Road Dog and Al Snow. You've got the Acolytes in there, Midian, and Mabel and The Undertaker is just looking on basically gives a, a speech of approval and says that hell is coming or something equally vague and prophetic kinda like he did on Raw 25 here are just some random words so main event time The Rock Triple H I quit match for the WWF title wow I think this was the beginning of Triple H's start in the main event scene really this seemed like his first initiation test if you like could he hang with those at the top of the card now the previous title match that these two had was at SummerSlam for the Intercontinental title and it was a very very good match and obviously by now The Rock had ascended to the top of the card this was the second time he'd won the WWF title at consecutive big four pay-per-views as well and this was Triple H's first sort of test at that level as well and you could tell that they put a lot of trust in him he dominated the vast majority of this match it was a bit back and forth at the beginning but once Triple H managed to get on top there were no fewer than three times when he pedigreed The Rock and went for the microphone and just as he was about to ask The Rock if he quit he went no I'm not finished and then he's about to pedigree him on the announce table and at this point the corporation rush the ring and grab hold of China and there's Kane there as well so that obviously ties into what we saw earlier with the whole Shane McMahon Kane thing and he's got her by the throat and has lifted her up ready to slam her down for the choke slam. And the corporation say to Triple H, look, you need to quit now, otherwise China is going straight through this damn ring. We're going to break her in half unless you quit now. 
And Triple H looks at the ring and he's like, oh, would they do it? And he looks at The Rock and he looks back up and just thinks, I can't risk it. Says I quit, throws in the towel, lets go of The Rock. The corporation sort of let China down gently-ish. And they gather The Rock up and, and kind of move their self away to the side. And at this point, Triple H comes into the ring and checks up on China just to see if she's all right. And Triple H is then just eyeballing everyone in the corporation and happens to have his back to China. And this is the night when China turns on Triple H and DX. She goes up behind him and gives him a massive low blow. Triple H goes down to his knees and just sort of looks up at China as if to say, what have you done? He falls to the floor and out comes Vince McMahon and Shane McMahon and it's hugs all round for China. They have managed to capture the muscle of DX. And what looked like at the beginning of the night to be a very bad night for the corporation turns out to be a very successful night. Yes, they lost the Tag Team Championships, but they managed to retain the WWF Championship. Vince McMahon has an opportunity to take the WrestleMania main event away from Stone Cold Steve Austin. And more importantly, they managed to take China away from DX and get her to join the corporation. So they are all standing very tall at the end of the night. Obviously, as we know, coming out of WrestleMania 15, things aren't quite so great for the corporation. They do manage to acquire Triple H when he turns on X-Puck, and they acquire the European title for Shane McMahon. But, as we know, The Rock does lose his championship to Stone Cold Steve Austin, so that we can prolong the Austin and McMahon storyline. But all told, the Raw after the Royal Rumble 1999 had very, very good segments of storytelling. And it had one very, very good match, the main event. To be honest, the other matches were very throwaway. The hardcore tag team match was probably the second longest on the card and was just smash someone around the head with a thing. The Val Venus and Tess match was very short and was really only there to make Ken Shamrock look strong. The Draws George Animal Steel match was completely pointless for anyone involved. The tag team title match made the new champions look as weak as was possible. So even though they lost the tag team titles, the strength still looked like it was with Ken Shamrock and the big boss man. So that's another tick for the corporation. X-Puck looked like an idiot for trying to trust Kane. Another tick for the corporation, especially Shane McMahon. Some things never change. And Billy Gunn and Goldust was okay, but it was very short. Yes, Gunn managed to win, but it was just through a distraction. And ultimately, he didn't manage to beat a corporation member. He just managed to beat somebody else on the roster. So, really at this time, if you weren't in the corporation, the only way you were going to get a push of any kind was if you were Mankind or Stone Cold Steve Austin, because screw you otherwise. So there we go, they were my thoughts on the Raw after the Royal Rumble 1999. If you remember this time quite fondly, please let me know in the comments below, and I will be back next month with a similar type of video for the Raw after In Your House 6, the final pay-per-view before WrestleMania 12, with the main event of Diesel and Bret Hart for the WWF title in a steel cage match. But until then, I have been that British guy, and I will see you very soon. Goodbye.